Okay, now let's look on page 15 to where do the dead go when they die. Uh, the purpose for this is primarily to help you as you read words in your Bible, if you're trying to figure out where do I see that word or how do we understand that word applying or who is this verse, verse talking about, this is a breakdown of the words that we see in our New and Old Testaments and where the author is describing. So present, we've described this again as this intermediate state between our present death and the return of Jesus Christ. So we, we first have the place of the righteous dead. Believers in Christ, the moment that they die, their body remains, their spirit continues. In the Bible, we might describe that as being heaven or paradise or Abraham's bosom or the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. There's also interchangeable locations. This is either the righteous dead or the unrighteous dead. And for, when you see these words in the Bible, especially in Psalms, um, the context is going to tell you which this is talking about. So we could even just say these are euphemisms for uh, the body as it dies. So the grave, abyss, Sheol, Hades, pit, death, or place of the dead. These places in our scriptures clearly are describing either the place of the righteous or the unrighteous dead. And then finally, there are pl three places that are only ever described as being the place of the unrighteous dead. Hell, Abaddon, or Gehenna. If that's the present, intermediate state, the Bible also uses words to describe the future, final state. For the righteous dead, we could call it heaven, new creation, a new Eden, new heavens, and new earth. The unrighteous dead, we would call that hell, Gehenna, lake of fire, or the second death. These are the descriptive words that we find in our scriptures. Now let's turn ourselves to some of the hermeneutical foundations. This is some of the, as we described, the hermeneutical grid, our interpretation that we bring to the Word of God. First, the inerrancy of scripture. That scripture is perfectly true and without the possibility of error. Second is the infallibility of scripture. Scripture is without the possibility of of error. And as we described earlier, this is a first order doctrine. If you do not believe the Bible is the word of God, then everything else in it is suspect. We hold to these truths as being perfectly true and self-evident. Next, the perspicuity of scripture, that the Bible is actually able to be understood. It, it is not unclear in its communication. Any unclarity is ultimately due to our human frailty, not the insufficiency of the word. Redemptive history. This is the idea of God working through human history to achieve his purposes of bringing salvation to his people and glory for himself. We describe really everything in the Bible as redemptive history, redemptive story. Progressive covenantalism. This is a very important expression. This is a Baptistic view of the progression of the covenants as they find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ and through his finished work to believers. Now, if you read anything out there about the covenants, uh, nine times out of ten, it's coming from a, a Presbyterian view of the covenants. But we Baptists, we, we land differently. We view the covenants differently. We're going to see what this looks like later on. But no, uh, progressive covenantalism, I believe, is the most robust Baptistic understanding of how we should view the covenants applying to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, promise and fulfillment. This idea of the promises in Scripture will find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Again, no blank slate. Everyone comes to the Bible where, with their base presuppositions and assumptions. Harmonization. The idea that we interpret Scripture in light of of Scripture. One of the greatest tools that we have to aid us as we come to the Bible is, of course, the rest of the Bible. Now, we look to the words of wise men who have come before us, present and, and dead, and those are invaluable tools. But ultimately, the authority of the Word of God is clarified through, through the equal authority found in the rest of the Word of God. We allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, and ultimately, 
we would argue they should harmonize. This is the idea. There's not one verse out there that does not fit with the rest. It says something different, that the faith is not actually found in Christ alone, right? We believe that all Scripture is designed to fit together perfectly like a, like a perfect puzzle piece. The analogy of Scripture, that we interpret the difficult texts in light of the easy. I mentioned this already, but this analogy of Scripture is one of the most important tools that you can have in your mind as you study any text of the Bible, especially a text like the book of Revelation. Again, one of the great dangers I've seen for myself and for others as well. Come across a word, an expression, a sentence, a paragraph, and believe that's it. I've discovered something new, or this is going to be the new foundational theology for the rest of my life. That's not how we, how we do things. We, we allow what is clear to dictate what is complicated, and especially a book like Revelation. We allow the clear teaching of Jesus, the apostles, and the New Testament writers to dictate the clarity that we should have for the book of Revelation and, and not the other way around. Literary, literary genre of Revelation specifically is prophetic apocalyptic literature, unlike any other book written in the New Testament. And what does that mean? If we interpret, for instance, a, a, a parable the exact same way that we do a history book of Deuteronomy, we're going to end up in, in a bad spot. Believe these are literal stories of literal events, and of literal people. We'll miss the depth and the beauty of a parable is not in the literal reality of it, but the deeper symbolism that it represents. That's the power of the parable stories. In the same way, friends, if we go to the book of Revelation and interpret it in the exact same way as we would the letter of Hebrews or the story of Acts, we should assume we're going to end up in some pretty bad places. That's not the same kind of genre of literature. Christocentric interpretation, a belief that every scripture finds its ultimate purpose in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Sense is planor or the fuller sense. This is the belief that the Holy Spirit, as the ultimate divine author, often intends a deeper and fuller meaning than that necessarily intended and known by the human author. One of the things we see in the New Testament, they make really, really clear. The Old Testament authors were looking through a glass dimly. They, they saw and they searched and they, they caught glimpses and, and shadows of Jesus Christ they saw in part, now we see the whole mysteries that even angels long to look into. Even angels confused by the story of redemption. No, the fuller sense is that God sometimes has a meaning that it is more and greater and deeper than that understood by the original author. And more, more so, friends, we don't always know what a prophet Isaiah has in his mind as he is writing down. Why? Because we know the Spirit is moving him. So we don't assume that we know or don't know what he knows, but what is clear is God ultimately has multiple meanings for any, any particular text. Next, we come to this idea of literal versus symbolic. And I would argue this is a sliding scale of biblical interpretation, specifically of prophetic literature, Right. On the literal side, folks are going to say that every single prophecy should have a literal, physical counterpart in recorded human history, whether past, present, or, or future. Uh, the sliding scale to symbolism says there might be a literal thing, but the deeper question to ask is what does this symbol represent? What does this thing image for us? Where do we see this echoed in other places in the Word of God? And I would just say this, it, it is a sliding scale. And I've seen plenty of authors who would describe themselves as being strict literalists until the moment they come to a verse or an expression or a moment that they can't believe is really literal, and then suddenly they'll say it's symbolic. At the same time, I've seen people who usually interpret things symbol, sim, you know, symbolically will come to something that sure seems literal, and they'll just slide that scale over. So just know it's not always bad. You don't have to commit yourself to one or the other. But know when you come to the Word of God, when there's a prophecy at play, when there's mysterious, beautiful, uh, rhythmic language going on, there is a sliding scale that we, we have in our mind whether or not that we, we know that it's there. Views of the rapture. I, I would say there's probably two major views of the rapture. We might call the first the full rapture. This is the idea that all Christians on earth will be taken up out of heaven, 
out of earth to live in heaven for a period of time. Now, some would say that's uh, all living Christians. Some would say that's only the Jews or only the Gentiles. Some would say that's only a period of seven years or maybe for 1,007 years or some variation of that. There's lots of different ways that can un unroll. But a full rapture is the idea that there is a moment in time where there are only unbelievers living on earth, right? We would describe that as the, as the full rapture. There's a second one that I would call the mini rapture. There is a moment, I would say it's clearly taught in scriptures, that all Christians on earth are taken up out of earth to meet the Lord in the air, but on the way back, we meet him as he is coming back to return, to reign on earth for forever. So there is a, a clear moment of a rapture. The question is, is it a long, full rapture comprising a thousand years, or is it momentarily? We meet him in the Lord in the air, and we come back immediately with Christ, and we reign for eternity. Those are the two ways of viewing this idea of the rapture. Views of the tribulation. This is uh, what we see, for instance, in Matthew 24. Uh, we call it the Great Tribulation. There are many other texts that describe this tribulation time that comes before the return of Jesus Christ. So there are kind of four major views of the tribulation. So pre-trib is the idea the church, all believers on earth, or just Jews or just Gentiles, are raptured before a seven-year tribulation period. And the tribulation is awful. Bad news bears, right? There's mid-trib in the middle of the seven-year period, three and a half years in, church is raptured. And then the, the last three and a half, which is the most brutal three and a half, that's when Christians are not on earth or only those who get saved during that last three and a half years. And then you have post-trip, the idea that the church is raptured at the end of the seven years, and then there is the, the millennium to follow, a thousand-year reign of Christ and, and binding of Satan. And then you have the no-trip, a view that would say that while there may be times of tribulation, uh, there is no future moment of tribulation nor rapture of, of the church. Let's look at some of the major schools of thought when it comes to interpreting the book of Revelation. This is the bottom of page uh, 16 in your workbooks. Futurism says this, the majority of the prophecies of Revelation will take place in the end times and are written to explain future events as they unfold in a linear timeline. Historicism is the idea the prophecies of Revelation have a literal one-for-one -one correlation with historical persons and events. Historicists seek to understand history by making each image of biblical prophecy have a literal historical counterpoint. Uh, this was a, a bit of a popular view during the, during the Reformation period. Idealism is the idea that prophecy of Revelation are primarily interpreted through the lens of symbolic allegoricalism. Idealists aren't looking for the future fulfillment of prophecy, but they do expect certain themes to come to fruition. Now we turn to this idea of, of preterism. We have what we might call full preterism. Based on Matthew 24, they would say the majority of biblical prophecies have already been fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D., Orthodox preterists would say we still await the bodily return of Christ and a new creation. However, I would say there are a group that we might call heretical preterists. They would say that we're done. Everything is fulfilled by AD 70 and life is as it is and everything is going to continue on at this point. This is a minority position, but there are some out there who hold to this view and I would say it's a heresy and we should condemn it as such clearly. Then you also have what we might call partial preterism. Again, partial preterism is the idea that there are parts of Matthew 24 that were fulfilled in AD 70 with the fulfillment yet to come. And, and with the last list, list, I'm going to give the position of amillennialism. This advocates for a redemptive, historical, idealist view along with partial pre preterism. And we're going to talk about more about this later on. But they believe this. Revelation is designed to be interpreted symbolically as it unpacks the reality of the church age. So Matthew 24 has some immediate fulfillment for the generation in those days who are living, yet full fulfillment is found when Christ um, returns. 
We're looking for Christ to, to work in creation, the story of redemption to come to its fruition the moment that Christ returns. Now let's look at, on page 17, some important theological topics. There are um, 16 important theological topics that we should consider before we turn to the book of Revelation. These topics will form a helpful grid and theological backbone to aid us in the work of interpretation. We will then look at the four major views and then finish up by considering the omnilineal view of progressive parallelism. So here I've listed for us the, the 16 views. So let's start with number one. This is the bottom of page 17. Um, how many judgment seats are there? Matthew 25, Jesus says this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne, and before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me food, and I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For you, I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me, and continues down. Truly, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, remind you what we read earlier, 2 Corinthians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I believe when you bring together all the data, all the verses in the New Testament from Jesus, the apostles, the biblical writers, and plenty of references from the Old Testament, the vision that we have is there's only one judgment seat. Some have multiple different judgment seats at different levels going through time. I would argue that's not what we see clearly taught in the rest of the, New, of the New Testament. And again, we know from the easy to the difficult, from the plainly perceived to what is more complicated. So however we view the book of Revelation, what is clear is there's only one judgment seat of Christ and all will stand and give account. Number two, a great question that we have to ask before we even open the book of Revelation is what about the Jews? So, there are five, we could say, major views regarding the relationship between ethnic Jews, salvation, the role of the Gentiles, and the new creation. And these views are largely tied to how we interpret the covenants of the Old Testament. And I'm going to hopefully make the case for that. Again, how you view the covenants will dictate how you view the, the role of the Jews and Gentiles, will dictate how you interpret the various prophecies that we find in the book of Revelation. So, First, what we call heretical dispensationalism. It's not in your paper because it's not worth it. Heretical dispensationalism, and I've heard guys say this at a conference, is there are two plans of salvation, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. Heretical dispensationalism says Jews are saved by keeping the law and Gentiles are saved by faith in Christ. And they would even go so far as to say, you can be a Gentile and you can become a Jew, you just got to keep the law. Or you can be a Jew and you can be a Christian, you just got to have faith in Christ. And I would argue that's a heresy. It's not cool. Um, no verse in the New Testament would allow for two plans of salvation. So we can re reject that wholesale. But there is another view that we call classic dispensationalism that teaches there are two methods of understanding how God has worked. There is the plan of the keeping the law and then the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in the revelation of Jesus Christ, we find this opportunity for Gentiles and Jews to get saved. On top of that, we have what we call progressive dispensationalism. This teaches that both Jews and Gentiles are saved by grace through faith in the church age, but there are clear different roles for them in a new creation. 
So the Jews get to live in, in Israel, in the land of Israel, and in the Gentiles, they live in all the rest of the world. They're in the, the kind of the darkened land. So the light is in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is. And the Gentiles, we're kind of invited into Jerusalem if we want to come. But then at nighttime, we have to find our own way back to our home. So kind of not a two separate approach of salvation, but a two plans of how the plan of salvation is worked out. So heretical dispensationalism is two plans of salvation. Um, classic dispensationalism is two distinct views of how God works with Jews and the Gentiles. And progressive dispensationalism would say, no, God is doing a thing through faith in Christ. It's building to that, but there's still a vision of two separate entities going into, into a new creation. Next, we come to what's called replacement theology, also called supersessionism. And that teaches that the new covenant in Christ supersedes the covenants made to the patriarchs. So basically, when the Jews rejected Jesus, Jesus rejected the Jews, says, fine, you don't want me? You don't get me. I'm going to the Gentiles now, and I'm going to do a whole new thing with them. Clearly not a thing that we see taught in our scriptures. Covenantalism, which is a, a more of a Presbyterian view, understands the church is inheriting the covenants of the Old Testament, while Christ is the fulfillment of the covenants. They also still continue in a modified form to the church. In this view, ethnic Jews are added to the church through faith, and, but they may enjoy a distinct place in a new creation. So a covenantalism uh, says covenants are not only a part of God's story of redemption, they're still kind of a binding part of that. And what do you see? You see some, uh, some Presbyterians who are Sabbatarians who believe that part of the law is still binding, um, though they tend to worship on, on Saturday, on Sunday instead of Saturday. You see some who are still um, doing infant baptism, and they would say it's a sign of the covenant, certainly new covenant, but they, they tie together the old um, with the new. As I mentioned before, I think a better way is what's called progressive covenantalism. This is a Baptistic view of the covenants that teaches that the covenants of the patriarchs were designed to prepare the way for ultimate fulfillment found in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the true final prophet, priest, king, every single promise made through the covenants only applied to those who were true Jews, ultimately Jesus was the only true perfect Jew who kept the law, who inherits the promises, and through his death, resurrection, ascension, now has grafted the Gentiles into the story of God. So we await the final consummation, the return of Christ. True Jews are those who respond in faith. And there is a hope, I would say, that the, there will be an ingathering of biolog biological Jews before the return of Christ. Will it be full and complete? Will every biological, ethnic Jewish person get saved? Probably not. But I do see a clear hope that there will be a great ingathering of many, many ethnic Jews right before Christ returns, when the, the season of the Gentiles is complete. So what about the Gentiles? If that's the hope for the Jews, Romans 2, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. First Peter 2, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Again, this is written to a primarily Gentile group of believers. Romans 9, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means, this is super important, church, that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You are all one in Christ, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Most of us at OEBC are Gentiles, not ethnic Jews. What is Paul telling the church in Galatia? Primarily ethnic Gentiles. In Christ Jesus we are heirs of Abraham according to the promise. We are true Jews. 
a Gentile who has faith in Christ is more of a Jew than somebody who can trace their biological family tree back to Abraham himself, but remains an unbeliever. Again, clearly this is the, the teaching of the New Testament. Let us, let us weigh in on here in Ephesians 2. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Literally, the only hope you could have as a Gentile was to be becoming a proselyte, becoming a Jew, moving to the land of Israel, having the sign of circumcision on your body, becoming ethnically Jewish in every possible way. And after a few generations, you could become married into the people of God. That was it. Salvation was found by being a part of ethnic Jewishness. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. What the covenants and the animals could never do, the blood of Christ succeeds. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and so making peace. Don't miss this, friends. This is not a rejection of the covenants. This is not a rejection of the people of Israel. It's a revelation that this has always been the plan that Jesus would be the fulfillment of the covenants and he is the point of everything that came before. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer, no longer strangers and aliens. What are we then? We are fellow citizens with the saints members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in the whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Friends, if you are a Christian, then you are a true Jew. You stand to inherit the promises through the true Jew, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to sprinkle blood that speaks a better word than the blood of of Abel. How is this possible? How is it possible that we Gentiles have been grafted fully into the household of God through the blood of the better covenant? Only Jesus Christ could achieve that. If that's true, then one of the great questions, and I'll be honest with you, for, for me, for many, many years, the, the defining question I had was, what about the land promises to Israel? There are many folks who would say, look, God has made promises, and he's good for them. And if they weren't fulfilled under the old covenant, then they must be fulfilled sometime in the new covenant. And they're looking for ethnic Israel to reclaim all that was promised to them. Here's what's really important. Irregardless of what happened uh, here in, in Israel in, in the last century, look at what Joshua says about this reality. The promises of God of a land in the land of Israel. Joshua 23, he says, And now I am about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass, not one has failed. Joshua 21, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. Don't miss this. This is super important. The Lord gave to Israel all of the land he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession and settled there. And they, the Lord, rest, Lord gave them rest on every side as he had sworn to their fathers. 
Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of the good promises the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So whatever we want to say about the land promises God gave, at least in Joshua, it says that in four different ways, not one word has failed. All the land promised to them. Now, did they get to inherit all of it? Well, no. They, they foolishly made some covenants they should not have made. They made peace with with neighboring armies they should not have made peace with, but ultimately it was their territory. They they were there, they were inhabiting the land. So I I would argue Joshua makes it clear that that first generation to go into the promised land got all of the land promised to them, even if they weren't living in all of it, even even if they hadn't booted out all of the pagan Gentiles who were living there. Now, if that's true, the next question we should be wrestling with is what about a future in-gathering of ethnic Jews. We've mentioned this before. Luke 21, it says this, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. What does that mean? Romans 11, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening, again, not complete, partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. What does that mean for us? I believe there is a partial hardening that we see generation upon generation. Some ethnic Jews coming to Christ, but it's only partial. There will be a coming day when there will be a great revival amongst ethnic Jews all over the world and they will come to Christ. As we mentioned, we don't know when. We don't know how long, we don't know how many, but we know that that is going to happen. When the last Gentile will be saved, there will be a moment of an ingathering of ethnic Jews, and then comes the end. Number six, this is the bottom of page 20. This age and the age to come. This is so, so helpful for us as we think about how we should approach the book of Revelation. Scripture only speaks of two ages, this age and the age to come. This age is descriptive of the present world as it runs its course before the final return of Christ. The age to come refers to the eternal state of the elect, the eternal judgment of the lost, the life in the new creation. This clear division between the ages helps us clarify whether we should expect a slow progress or a clear moment of division between the two. What I mean to say is is Scripture doesn't offer a kind of a middle course Now, some folks would say, again, there is a a third age, a middle age between this age and the age to come. But I would argue I'm not seeing that taught anywhere in our New Testament. It's just this age and then the age to come. So let's look at some of these verses. There are dozens, but we'll look at a few of them. Romans 12, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Ephesians 4, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, both not only in this age, but also in the one to come, in the age to come. Luke 20, Jesus said, The sons of this age marry and are given a marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Don't miss Luke 20 here. Jesus is saying there is an age which there is no marriage, this age. There is an age which there is no marriage, and that is the age to come. This age, the age to come. Matthew 12, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Again, two ages, this and the one to come. What is the thing that separates them? That's what we're going to see here. Number seven, the top page 21, the day of the Lord. Scripture speaks of the day of the Lord, the day, the day, at day, uh, the day of Yahweh is a future moment for, of judgment for the lost and for the saved. The lost will receive eternal judgment. The saved will receive eternal reward. There are also what I call preparatory days of judgment. Moments of earthly judgment that symbolically point towards the great judgment yet to come. In many of our translations, when, when you see this, you'll see it will be a capital D, the, the day of the Lord. Isaiah 2, the haughty looks of man shall be brought low, the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, for the Lord of hosts has a day 
a day that is against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Why is that important? Again, as we're going to see here, I I believe there's just one moment, the moment that Christ returns, that is the, the bookend of this creation and the beginning of the next. At that moment, when Christ returns, the cry command, the voice of an archangel, that is the day of judgment. Isaiah 4, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. Again, don't miss this. There is the day. The day is not just a word of judgment, though. It's also a day of reward. Who is that? For the survivors of Israel, all who have the faith of Abraham. There's beautiful and glorious things that the day will be revealed And he who is left in Zion, don't miss this, those who are left, those who are taken away, are taken away to judgment. Those who are left, who survive the day, what is there? They should be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. Again, we hear echoes of the Lamb's book of life, the names written down. Then the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. Again, this is Isaiah writing 2,700 years ago, describing the day of the Lord. What does that look like? Those who are in their sin are washed away, are are unclean and are taken into judgment. Those who remain, the survivors, the, the remnants, they inherit a new heavens and a new earth, a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning for those who are lost and beauty and glory for those who are saved. When does that happen? On the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy, destroy its sinners from it. And as we read the rest of Isaiah You're going to hear lots of images that you've probably read before in your Bible. And again, what is this describing? This moment, the day of the Lord. The stars in the heavens, their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. And I will punish the world for its evil and all the wicked for their iniquity. And I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. And I will make the people more rare than fine gold and mankind more than gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. If you're tracking through this series together, what's really clear is this is the day of the Lord. The cry of command, the voice of an archangel. What happens? The dead in Christ are, are raised. Those who are living on, the, on earth in that moment will raised with the Lord and then we will descend. And so we will always we live with the Lord. There will be a separation of the sheep and the goats, the righteous through judgment, will be purified, will be cleansed, new, beautiful, eternal bodies into a new, beautiful, eternal creation. Those lost, judged for their sins and cast into outer darkness. It is a day of wrath and of fierce anger. Now, when does that happen? One moment, the day of the Lord. And we do not know the day or the hour. Isaiah 24, on that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of earth on the earth. And they will be be gathered together as prisoners in a pit, and they will be be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. I believe that's a description, right, of the place of the unrighteous dead, uh, the place of demons and the place of the unrighteous dead awaiting that final judgment. And then the moon confounded, the sun ashamed. The Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and Jerusalem, and his glory will be before the elders. Again, on the day of the Lord, those stuck in gloomy chains of darkness will be released only for their verdict of guilty. Joel 3, put in the sickle and the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Don't miss this. What does this look like? An image in your mind of a man riding on a horse whose robes have been dipped in blood, only it's not his own blood. Jesus 
treading the winepress of his fury. That's the image that we have here. 14 multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Again, the sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion, utters his voice from Jerusalem, this cry of command. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. Friends, all this happens at one moment on the day of the Lord. Zechariah, on that day, there will be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that ye shall be remembered no more. And I will also remove from the land the prophets in the spirit of uncleanliness. Again, this prophetic vision of the day of the Lord, this is really important. This is speaking through prophetic idiom. This is speaking in ways its original audience could understand the depths of the fullness and the meaning is hidden from their eyes. This day is a day of cleanliness. Sin is no more. Unrighteousness is, is no more. This is entering into a new creation, but using language they could visually understand, heightening their, their anticipation for Jesus, for Yahweh to return. First Corinthians 1, down the very bottom on page 22. You are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, deliver a man over to Satan so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. 1 2 Timothy, henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that he will award me on that day. And not just to me, but all who have loved his appearing Revelation 6, then the kings of the earth, the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and among rocks and the mountains, calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Friends, as we wait for the return of Jesus Christ, we are waiting for the day, for this moment where Christ will return in power and in glory and in justice and usher us into a new creation. So one of the questions is, how do we get there? And this is where the popularity of the rapture comes into place. And here's what I would say. If the rapture is, is true, if the rapture is in the Bible, then there are certain views of Revelation that make a lot of sense. Uh, but if the rapture is not true, if the rapture is not clearly taught in Scripture, then we should be suspect of some views that hold to the bodily zooming away of believers on earth. So I would say this, a common view in some circles is that there will be a full rapture of all believers at one moment, all the Christians on earth will be taken up out of earth, leaving the unbelievers behind. Some tie the rapture to the coming tribulation. The rapture will either take place before, during, or after that great tribulation. Others hold to a modified mini-rapture. That believers on earth will be caught up to meet Jesus as he is coming back to earth. These believers are then transformed and immediately returned to earth. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to look at all the texts that have ever been used to advocate for a rapture. And let's just see what the Word of God, what the Word of God says. Isaiah 27. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and you'll be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown. And those who are lost in the land of Assyria and those who are driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Again, we've heard this symbol of a trumpet being blown before. 
Now, again, the question is, is this only referring to ethnic, biological Jews who have gone to these various nations? Or is it describing all the remnant, the people of God being called home? And I would believe this is, again, prophetic imagery describing that moment when the trumpet is blown and all God's people gather together. But what is this key idea here? The Lord will thresh out the grain. What does that mean? Th- those who are carried away, those who are blown away, that's the chaff. The, the wind drives away the stuff that's not good for anything but to be burnt up. The good, the kernels of grain, man, they fall to the ground. They, those are the ones who remain. So there's no image of a rapture here. The image is a threshing, a cleansing, a purification. Those taken away are taken away to judgment. Those remain, enter into a new creation. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will all gather his elect from the four winds from the the end of heaven to the other. Now, again, the question here is this referring to a rapture of the church up and out of earth permanently or for seven years or a thousand years? No, this is the day of the Lord. The, the nations are mourning because they know judgment has come. So, this is not a secret rapture of, the, of believers where they're just walking around and their bodies disappear and their clothes fall to the ground empty like a magician's trick. No, this is, this is the day of the Lord. The nations are ready to now be judged and we are all gathered together, all together, and we meet the Lord in the air, the living and the dead. Again, clear reference to a mini rapture, not the idea of a bodily sucking out of Christians from earth for a thousand years. Now, Matthew 24, we see it again repeated in Luke 17. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the days of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. What does that mean? The waters of judgment, as they were in the days of Noah, come and they take away everyone to judgment. Those who are left behind, those who are the ones who survive the purging of God's wrath on the day. Two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Don't miss this. Where is the one taken off to? Taken to hell. This is talking about the the judgment Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Who is the woman taken away? The ones who are not in Christ. Who is the one who are left? That's the remnant, true Israel, ready to inherit a new creation. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. Verse 44 of that section. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect 1 Corinthians 15, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does this perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Again, whenever Paul talks about a mystery, light's going off. This is an exciting moment for us. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be slaves. What does that mean? People living on earth the moment that Christ returns who are believers. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet... Don't miss this. This is not a preliminary trumpet. This is it. Tied with the the cry of command and the voice of an archangel. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on the immortality. What does that mean? The moment that Christ returns. I hope you're you're hearing all these references all completely linked together in perfect, perfect clarity. Friends, the Bible wants us to know what's going on. The Spirit wants us to understand God has written the Word for us to to hear and to believe and to live. At a moment, the last trumpet will sound. We will all be changed. The dead raised, the living resurrected, drawn together to meet Christ, and so we will always be with the Lord. Where? A new creation. The, The immortality, the immortality of this creation. Last verse that's used to sometimes argue for a, a full rapture of the church. 
1 Thessalonians 4, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Jesus will bring every single person who has fallen asleep, every person who has died is coming back with Jesus. For we declare this to you by a word from the Lord. He's saying this is carried down from things that Jesus himself said, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Some folks are saying, look, those who have died, they're, they're gone. Like they're, they're in another place and they don't get to inherit the full beauty of heaven. And Paul is like, no, 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 no. Not only will, they not, will we not precede them, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. I believe that means that those who've already died and have passed away, they're in the place of the righteous dead. They're coming with Jesus. They might even receive their glorified bodies before the living do. And then we who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. And we saw Paul wrote to church in 1 Corinthians, like the gathering from the four corners of the world, right? All the believers who are living caught up together. We will meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So here's the great question. I know for probably for many of us, we, we just believe the rapture because that's what we've heard our whole life. And we have various views of theology out there that that must be case. There may be a future bodily rapture of all believers out of earth for a period of time. But I would have to say we've not seen it yet. So the Bible doesn't teach a full rapture of believers. It teaches what we call the mini rapture meeting him on his way back to earth. So what does that mean? Well, there's some views, again, of Revelation that would say Christians are secretly raptured away in the night for a period of, again, a thousand years or for seven years. And I would say that's not something we see taught clearly anywhere else in the New Testament. It might be true, but it's not made the case here. In fact, all we see is the idea of the living dead and the unbelieving, and living dead and the unliving dead are raised together in a moment and so we will always reign with Christ. All right, let's turn to number, tw- number nine on page 24. One of the great questions. Who is the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, and the Antichrist? Let me read this passage for us here. The scriptures tell us that the spirit of Antichrist has always been and will continue until the end. There is also one final Antichrist yet to be revealed. This Antichrist might be a literal person, or it may be a government-led heresy and accompanying expansive persecution of the church. The spirit of Antichrist takes two distinct forms, religious Antichrist and political Antichrist. The spirit of religious Antichrist arises from within the church or other religious religions that pervert the true gospel. The spirit of political Antichrist is the secular will of nations to demand ultimately full allegiance and worship. The New Testament describes these Antichrists as the man of sin, the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. The final Antichrist will be revealed in the final days, along with a final great apostasy and rebellion, as the Antichrist demands full allegiance and worship. The spirit of Antichrist is also found reflected in the New Testament teachings and warnings of false Christs, false prophets, and false teachers. Not, not all of the verses use the same word. So some of the authors tend to use the word Antichrist or the man of lawlessness or the man of sin. But when you tie together the the work of this individual, pretty clearly ties those things together as referencing one kind of idea. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the main texts used to describe the work of the Antichrist. So let's look at these verses again. Now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, And our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Clearly, this was an issue. Folks are sending out letters and and writing that this heightened anticipation of the day is not only some future moment, but we missed it. It's already happened at a previous time, and 
what's going to happen to us now? Maybe, maybe we can't go into a new creation. Maybe we don't get to go to heaven when we die, right? You can imagine the kind of fear and confusion this would, this would create. Some being letters authored supposedly by the apostles themselves. So Paul here is warning them, hey guys, don't worry about that. Let me tell you what you should be looking for. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come. This is huge. Here, Paul is telling, telling them what to look for for the day of the Lord. Unless this rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, it's important to know that any time the Apostle Paul uses the idea of the word temple in the rest of his writings, it only ever refers to the church. Now, it could be this one moment he's referring to a physical, literal temple in Jerusalem, or it could be referring to the church. Do you not remember... What, that when I was with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. As you already mentioned, for those who want to say this is, has to be a single uh, individual person called Antichrist, if he's being restrained 2,000 years ago, then he must still be alive somewhere on earth, which could be completely true. I believe there's a deeper symbolism going on than, than that reality. But what do we know? That this Antichrist is presently being restrained. Why? So that he may be revealed in his time. So whoever or whatever this Antichrist is, presently there is a restraining, a, a limiting of his power on earth for the right time. And what I believe is that coincides with a limiting of or the restraining of the powers of darkness in the church age as the Gentiles are becoming followers of Christ. That is what's going on. And when is that time up? When, when, when Satan is loosed, when he is now freed to deceive the nations, we'll see the power of the Antichrist come to bear. A single individual? Possibly, yeah, but but more so a whole worldwide religion, right? Some version of this kind of rebellion and apostasy, if possible, even to confuse the elect, right? So this is this idea that we're looking forward to. So again, he tells him, you know what's restraining him now. He'll be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. He's saying what is true now will only increase in that day. It's not that it's not true now, and it will be true then. What is already here now, ebbing and flowing, the fullness of it, will be the moment when the restraining power is lifted. I believe that's a, that's a withdrawing of the power of the Spirit and also a releasing of the powers of darkness right before the day of the Lord. And then the lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. Again, certainly we see that depicted in the book of Revelation, right? The sword of the mouth coming out from Jesus, destroying the rebellious peoples. I think that's a very clear correlation being made there for us. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Again, the activity of Satan, that the limiting of Satan's power now to deceive the nations will one day run its course. And I believe when the, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, the last Christian to be saved who's a Gentile, two things will happen. I believe Satan released, Antichrist revealed, coming in power, and an ingathering of the Jews. How long that's going to be, uh, I don't believe Scripture is clear, but there is a season where that's going to be the Christ. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Don't, don't miss. Again, what is that? Strong delusion. Again, a pulling of the back of the spirit, a giving over to the human heart of depravity, coinciding with the release of Satan, the rising of the Antichrist, and an ingathering of the Jews. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So whatever is going on with the Antichrist, the moment that he is revealed in power over the nations, and we're going to see in a minute that what, what that looks like lived out. There is a pulling back of the power of the Holy Spirit to bring condemnation, a giving over of the hardness of their hearts to more and deeper depravity so that Satan might have his way. 
and an ingathering of the Jews. And if we can just be honest, so we think about the story of redemption, this partial hardening of the Jews, we can imagine a time when that's no longer the case. We can see the mercy of God in allowing this remnant of ethnic Jews to be saved right before the end. I mean, that ties a beautiful bow on God's work of redemption for ethnic Jews, right? But at the same time, what about the Gentiles? Right? When the last Gentile is saved, what happens to everyone else? What does he do? He doesn't just say, and everything continues. I'm going to bring judgment now. No, no, no. He says, I'm going to give you over to the depravity of your hearts. The judgment that I'm about to release upon you, you are going to earn all of it. Does that make sense? You're going to, you're going to see that reality, that depravity being lived out on planet Earth in those days. All right, let's keep going. A few of these verses. First John 2. Children, it is the last hour. As you heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Again, Church, throughout church age, it's always been a question. Who's the Antichrist? Is they the Antichrist? Is he the Antichrist? The answer usually is yes. The problem is thinking he is the capital A Antichrist. Oh, it's definitely Nero. Well, Nero was Antichrist, but there's more to come still. Does that make sense? So we don't want to be the hubris of assuming that we know who the Antichrist is. But what do we know? Many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain. They are not of us, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Here you see the role of the Antichrist. Antichrist, the one who blasphemes ultimately Jesus, who blasphemes the gospel. 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every false spirit, but test the spirits and see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Don't miss this. The the false prophets here is the same kind of spirit as the spirit of Antichrist. By And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. What you've heard was coming is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them. For he who is with you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Second John 1, this is love we walk according to the commandments. And this is a commandment you've heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Don't miss it, the deceiver. That's a descriptive word for Satan himself. He's saying that spirit of antichrist, Jesus has not come in the flesh. That is a spirit of the deceiver. That is a spirit of the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for. Let's uh, let's pause right here, and let's go ahead and turn over to uh, to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Um, This is one of the key texts that, that many, many folks have, and... It's really important that we, we address what this, what this looks like. This is called the, the Olivet Sermon. Jesus here foretelling uh, the, the destruction and the, the coming of the age to come. What is very, very important, though, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 24, you're going to want to read these. Pause the video if you need to. Matthew 24, okay, now look verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you see, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus has just been finished preaching a whole sermon of of proclamations of destruction upon the scribes, upon the Pharisees, upon the rejection of Israel, upon the temple itself. With that in mind, look at verse 1, 24. Jesus left the temple, and when he was going away, his disciples came to point to him the building of the temple. But he answered them, Do you see all these? Truly I say to you, 
There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, what is the background here of Matthew 24? It is Jesus' words of, of destruction, of judgment upon the religious leaders of Israel, upon the people of Jerusalem because of their rebellion, and upon the temple itself. And what is so cool, what do we know? When the Roman Empire came into the land of Israel, literally, there was gold in the temple, the temple got burned, and the Roman soldiers wanted all that sweet gold that had melted in between the rocks, and they literally separated stone from stone. The entire temple was destroyed, brick by brick. So that is the background of Matthew 24. So let's look at verse 3. As he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Again, this is a secret meeting they had, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice, this is not one single question. There's multiple questions they've wrapped together, and that's exactly how Jesus responds. And no, this is secret. First of all, no, they're terrified. This is a harsh, harsh word. Jesus, their, their great disciple, or just told them that every single brick in the temple, these are massive bricks, uh, 30 feet long, 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide. They were huge stones. And he's saying every single one of these bricks is going to be separated. The, the, the temple in the Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, right? Imagine if somebody came coming to you and saying, guess what? D, Washington, D.C., every single monument is going to be eviscerated. And then they walk away. You're going to walk up and say, like, what do you know? Is there a bomb going to go off? Like, there's questions you're going to have. That's the backdrop, the emotion that his disciples come to their great rabbi, Jesus. When will, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? Jesus said, see to no one leads you astray. Many will come my name saying, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against nation, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. So here's a question. Are these things that were happened before the temple was destroyed in AD 70? The answer, of course, is yes. Are these things that are still happening as we await the return of Christ? The answer is, of course, yes. If you're hearing, you're, you're remembering we talk about prophetic fulfillment, uh, this dualistic reality. There can be both an initial fulfillment and packed into that language is the greater fulfillment yet to go. Okay, so we're standing on, on, on the edge of the Puget Sound next to Jesus, hearing him talk about the, the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in AD 70 while simultaneously describing the day of the Lord. That's Mount Rainier to us. This is the day that Christ returns. That is the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tri tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then will come the end. Now, here's the thing. Everything Jesus says in verses 9 through 14, did that happen before AD 70? And I would say, yes, we, we see all these things happening, even just in the writings of the New Testament, that betraying one another, hearts growing cold. But is that the end of the story? No, that, that is initial fulfillment we see in AD 70, the greater moment of apostasy, the greater moment of tribulation is yet to come on the day of the Lord. Verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the house stop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not return back to his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Now, question, again, what is this moment talking about? Well, clearly, uh, AD 70, this is describing exactly what happened when Emperor Tiberius came to the city of Jerusalem. He completely destroyed it. And Christians living in Jerusalem in AD 70 remembered the words of Christ, and they hightailed it out of town. They barely survived the onslaught complete and total destruction, such as never been before. 
Many nations have come and attacked and destroyed Jerusalem, but nothing like AD 70. It was total and complete. No two stones standing. For there will be a great tribulation, such as never been from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be again. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being will be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and form great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. I would argue we should interpret these verses again as an initial fulfillment on the day of judgment befalling the people of Israel. Total, complete destruction in AD 70. But they're a foretaste of the judgment the tribulation, the Antichrist, yet to come down the road. And I hope you understand that that dual fulfillment prophecy is what Jesus can do because he is the ultimate prophet. So I would personally draw a line right here. And I would say everything that came before there is partially fulfilled in AD 70. The fulfillment is the, the day to come on the day of the Lord. And then verse 29, here we see the full coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, now again, as we interpret scripture, we have the the, the zoom button, the prophet spoke through, where a thing can happen, then the next thing can happen, and we look at it and say that happened a few hundred or a few millennia years apart, but the prophecy continues as, as one whole narrative. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, what do we see? Don't, we've read many, many verses already together describing this idea of the day of the Lord, the, the return of Jesus. The sun we darken, the moon not give its light, stars fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then will appear in, in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. All the tribes in earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and a loud call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, then then Jesus finishes up. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So the question again is, how do we understand these verses? All that was fulfilled in AD 70 was fulfilled completely and accurately by the words of Jesus. The great fullness of of the day of the Lord, that is yet to come. And we see that in the very, very next verse. My word shall not pass away. Verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And then he continues. The verses we've read about this idea of the rapture, some washed away in judgment. The those who remain, remain for eternity. Therefore, you must be ready, he says, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Blessed is a servant whom the master finds waiting when he returns. So, as we think through this this idea of the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, we think about Matthew chapter 24. I think we can see all these verses, friends, absolutely connect together beautifully, perfectly, harmoniously. We'll take a break here, and in a minute, we will start looking at the counterfeit trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet.